right. Hello, everyone. I see we already have quite the crowd. Hi. Uh, welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of Star Trek Fenrir. For those that are unfamiliar, Fenrir is a tabletop role-playing game that uses the Star Trek Adventures rule set. We are set in the year 2411 aboard a Cerberus class that is following in the footsteps of the old USS Ophion. Now, you don't need to have watched Ophion to enjoy this game, though you probably will catch a few references and subtle nods if you do, especially for this session. Uh, you can catch the VODs for both Fenrir and Ophion on my YouTube and most of the popular podcast solutions. I have two quick announcements this week. The first is that my newest game, Star Trek Mata Hari, uh, had a great session zero, and you can catch the VOD for that on all the same places that I mentioned before. But relevant to the stream is they will actually be streaming live starting May 2nd, so please look forward to that. Uh, the other announcement is just sort of a reminder that I've switched podcast providers. You still should be able to get my content everywhere you could before, but now we're syndicating out to the greater sort of podcast arena. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to say before we do intros is I appreciate whatever support you can provide for the stream, whether it's simply showing up with your lovely faces, chatting in chat, following, subbing, donation, etc., etc. It's all greatly appreciated. Just make sure to take care of yourselves first. And uh, again, whoever keeps doing those bit bombs, I'm going to find you eventually. Just, we're going to have words, nice words, but I'm going to find you eventually. And with that, let's go ahead and do our round of introductions, starting with Mr. Rast. Hi, um, my name is John. Uh, I play Rast, the second officer uh, on the Fenrir. Um, he is a Romulan slash Betazoid, uh, and I I personally live in Seattle. Uh, I go by Chubby Cobold, uh, Ch so Chubby Cobold Gaming. Uh, is where you can find me out there in the world. And he's already started. I see you in chat. I see you. Thank you, but I see you. Anyway, sorry. Matic, your turn. Uh, pretty much go by Matic in the community. Um, real name is James, based out of Houston. Uh, I play the chief engineer. Um, at some point in the session i'll probably end up breaking the gm and the game i don't know why it just keeps happening um other than that i got nothing else cool watney i am watney um i play captain slash commodore brie archuleta um a human woman in her late 30s i am one of three co-hosts of beyond trek podcast you can find me on twitter at watney of btp and then mr dag Hey everybody, I'm Dag. I play Vassar Fenrir's holographic uh, Vulcan Archive Lieutenant Commander Science Officer. Uh, I am from Central Valley, California, and you can find me out there in the world at Trek Nexus. Mr. Williams. Uh, hey guys, I'm Aaron, physically based in Prince Edward Island, Canada. I play Commander RJ Williams, Fenrir's Chief of Security. Um, you can find me across socials at Panorama Tint. Okay. And last but not least, Mr. Matthew. Uh, I'm Matthew. I play Lieutenant Commander Lee Tobin, uh, one of the Fenrir's science officers. He's a fairly intensely religious Bajoran who has joined Starfleet um, as an active kind of devotion to the emissary. Very nice. And with that, let's run our intro and get into things.
Jeez. And welcome back, everyone. Apparently, we are uh, climbing in numbers steadily. So, hi again to everyone who's rolling in. Anyway, uh, if you're not familiar with how I like to start my games, I usually have the captain or another officer read an opening log. And tonight, it is going to be from the captain. So, Archuleta, take it away. Gladly. Captain's Log, Stardate 88759.2. Some would call the idea of deep space exploration exciting. Those people have never been on the border of a hostile confederacy holding together the three separate pieces of their badly damaged starship by sheer will alone. Pile that on top of destroying a Ferengi vessel with potentially thousands of innocent lives on board, and you can imagine the state of the crew's morale. We had no idea how many were on board the Latinum's lure that hadn't been infected with Sean. It could have been everyone, or no one. We were, however, able to safely transport over Savia moments before the detonation of the lure's cargo and extract the Sean controlling her. As for Fenrir, she needs repair badly. We are unable to disengage multi-vector assault mode until her structural damage is fixed, a task which cannot be done without a star dock. I'm still curious about those unexplored coordinates. While we prepare to head for the closest station, Rast has suggested a mind meld in the hopes of discovering more information about that location that I might unknowingly possess from my time as the Sean's thrall. I've read unless the person is trained in how to meld properly, there can be consequences. And although I dislike the idea of someone poking around in my mind again, and I've read, uh, there could, oh, what? <laughs> Captain pauses I, in her logs, okay. looks at her very And although I dislike the idea of someone poking around in my mind again, I trust Rast, even for all of his secrecy and mystery. So I've agreed to it. I'm sure I'll discover more about him and why our paths crossed at the end of the war before I took command of the Fenrir. End log. Alrighty. So, our first scene is quite literally going to be that uh, mind meld, as it were. Now, I have this taking place in the ready room, but would you have preferred to have it done elsewhere? Yeah, that's fine. Alrighty. So, Captain, you are uh, in your ready room uh, when there's a chime at your door, and in walks Mr. Rast. Hello, Commander. Are you ready, Commodore? Anything I should know? Have you done this before? <laughs> uh, this will be my first time. <laughs> Phrasing. <laughs> um, all right. Well. But I have done quite a bit of research. All right. Um, well, I think it's worth the risk, so shall we? He takes a seat and he's, uh, he like Mr. Miyagi's his hands together. You know, <laughs> it gets them nice and, uh, nice and warm and, uh, reaches forward and, uh, says, just relax. It's all just you have to do. Just a deep breath relaxes so you put the fingers on the requisite pressure points and you do the my mind to your mind your thoughts to my thoughts etc etc and as this happens uh, i would like you to roll me a control and a medicine please mr rast the difficulty here is a one control and medicine not my strongest scores, which I'm sure the captain is happy to hear. Do we have other Vulcans on board? I mean, you have the SAR. But he can't really do that. Well, if you subscribe to the Picard thought. <laughs> I guess I kind of do since he's not Vulcan. So. <laughs> you know what? I'm even going to give you a threat to start. <laughs> It's a good way to start the session, giving me yep. just enough for a board cube. I love it. Yep. And um, I'm gonna I'm going to uh, say that I have a focus here between mm -hmm. behavioral analysis and uh, forensic psychology. Yeah, you would have one. Okay. All right, here goes the roll. Here goes nothing, guys. Look oh, at that! Three oh, successes. Yeah. That's two momentum. 
So I believe each of you actually has prepared what you see of the other before I tell you what you actually get about the coordinates. So why don't we start with what Archuleta sees of Rast. Okay. So Archuleta is looking at, at Rast and the last thing she sees is uh, his eyes kind of roll back in his head. Uh, and then suddenly she's in a hallway and there's red lights just flashing in a rhythmic cadence. Uh, and she's stumbling down this hall. Um, there's a smell that just fills the entire complex. It's an unmistakable aroma of burnt flesh that's just seeping into everything. Uh, there's smoke that's completely filling the compound and your mouth is filled with the taste of ash and soot. Um, the ringing in your ears is just overwhelming as it just mutes and muffles everything, which uh, may still be for the best because you remember the last thing hearing were screams. Um, then the, the memory kind of uh, like almost statics for a second, and it's fractured and twisted as the scene changes. A small viewer, like almost like a handheld, uh, like iPad mini, um, shows a man in a darkened Starfleet uniform with no sign of rank or affiliation, but there's still something very Starfleet about the uniform itself. The man speaks up. So, Mr. Kiev, are you still on board? Remember, what you do now is for the future of billions. Starfleet will not forget this, and we will be waiting. Just give me a call. Rast, I don't mean... I guess this is wrong. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> just call... Uh, and then you say, just call me Rast. Uh, I don't, I mean, I guess it's wrong, and, well, this does need to end. I have your word that no one will be hurt, correct? And then the voice on the pad says, you have my word, Tyson out. Then suddenly, uh, the G-force, uh, the, the whole scene kind of shifts again, and the G-forces thrust you into an already badly damaged seat in your life pod. Your hearing starts to return in time to hear a calm computer voice report 19 hours of life support remaining. Severe damage on all guidance, communications, and sensor systems. Automated beacon terminated after two attempts. Risk of detection outweighs value of asset. And the last, uh, the last thing you say, fuck! And then you turn around and you thrust your fist into a nearby, nearby panel. Liars, after all that I just did for you, he screams into the air, uh, his blood pressure rising as he passes out. Then the scene shifts and fidgets again for a second. And you see that you are standing in a room. Um, there's a small device in your hand that Tyson had given you before. He had instructed you that this would nullify mental abilities. And you approach the training holodeck, a place that you know that you've been every day for years and years. There's 14 trainees in this room, including yourself. You stand at attention, ready to continue the training. And then the device just flies from your hand and it hovers in the room. Rest, uh, you react just in time and you duck and cover the fire and shrapnel just tear through the other bodies. The screams would be unbearable if not for the fact that the explosion had completely overloaded his hearing. So, and then your uh, visions into Rast's past fade. Very nice. Now on the same token, Archuleta, what does Rast see? Well, he will know everything about her um he will experience her first memories on starbase 74 where she met her mentor as a small child um her first heartbreak before leaving the academy leaving to go to the academy on earth um her coming in fourth at the academy marathon and championing championing her wrestling weight class of the 20 2391 tournament 
Um, he would experience her memories from the USS Yamato, her first posting, the night she was approached by Starfleet Intelligence and a week later when she turned them down. He would see and feel her losing the captain and chief of security on the USS Montgomery Scott during the Klingon War that she was XO of. Um, you might recognize Williams in that memory as well. Um, he would also recognize her perspective of discovering his shuttlecraft that had crashed and uh, his subsequent rescue. Um, and lastly, he'd experience the Sean possession, the two month long confinement of her mind and the discovery and removal of the parasite leading up to the moment they're currently in. Alrighty. So uh, it is not just these two things that you sense from one another. Because you succeeded on your role rast, what you realize is that as the memories and visions shift, you look at a point in space, but it's very odd. And by that I mean that this point of space is devoid of all starlight, of all sense of being. It is pure darkness. And in the center of this darkness, you have just this subtle pull, like you, you, you are drawn into the center. And as you look at this, whatever it is, there's a voice. It is the voice of the Sean hive mind. And the voice says, soon, just soon, nothing else. And then both of you snap back to reality. Mind meld ends. You may pick it up from there. So Bree had kind of been staring through him as she experienced everything. And when she like comes out of it, she looks to see like if he experienced anything or found anything out. So his nose is bleeding and uh, he looks up. Did, did you see this soon? Did you experience... The Sean. I heard it. I feel like I've... That's been... I've known that, but I, not until now. Somehow. Seems that they've... Well. Hopefully that helps guide your decisions. Well, I'm not sure... It gives us a direction, but... And she's like hesitating to talk about what she saw with him because she isn't sure what the etiquette is mm -hmm. <laughs> with my melding. Like, do you bring up stuff like that? But she's decided to just ruminate on it a little bit, but she is like kind of sweating and clammy. He stands up and straightens his uniform. Was, was there anything else, Captain? I mean, Commodore, sorry. And he grabs a hold of his head. Are you okay? Just feels like a headache. Is that normal? First time. Ah, well, uh, report to sick bay. I decide. Very well. Yes, Commodore. And he uh, snaps to attention and uh, turns to leave. She'll tap her comm badge to reach Maddock and check in to see how long until we can head towards the station. You're, You're muted. muted. Now, is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Captain, this is Lieutenant Zero. Uh, Maddock has left me in charge of the Gamma section. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, he's currently in his lab with the counselor. Um, I am unsure if the doctor is there as well, seeing as he decided to leave his arm on the bridge. 
is there anything you would like, Captain? You said he's with the counselor in his lab? She beamed over at some points, but none of us are able to gain access to his lab. All right. I'll go check on him, as you were. All right, Captain. So the scene shifts to the exterior of the science lab. And uh, Commodore, when you step up to the door, there is the sound of the sort of computer going and not letting you in. Yeah, I do sound effects sometimes. They're great. I love it. Um, <clears throat> she'll ring it again. There's another air. <laughs> um, <laughs> she'll press the page button to open up the speaker and be like, Maddox, this is Bree. Uh, you hear... You hear whisperings like he's just like you hear like there's a conversation going on, but it's it's just it's just like you have to strain to hear what's being said. And all you can really hear is Matic just repeating. No, 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 no. That's not right. No, no, no. Well, maybe this will. He's just he it doesn't seem like he's talking to anyone more than just talking to himself. OK, Um computer override lock to uh, engineering lab authorization Archuleta Delta 9 or 7 7 okay captain I'd like you to roll me a control and a security please difficulty Ooh. of two though what I would say is I will spend threat to make it a difficulty three because as we know Matic is a squirrely sort he probably has extra security on this door I also think we have two momentum from that earlier role that was never recorded. That is correct. Oh, do we? Yep. Starfleet protocols? That would apply. Okay. Um, I'm going to use momentum to roll three. Okay. And you get the three requisite successes. So when the door opens, what do we see on the other side, Matic? What is the state of not only Matic, but the lab itself? Um... Where his arm is removed, it's it looks like there's been like a haphazard kind of like a field job of somebody bandaging it. Um, I don't know if you want to put the counselor in here. That's but if she is here, she'll be sta she'll just kind of be standing off to the side taking notes. Um, on all the screens, though, you see them running a uh, you'll see them running a program. As you go to look to them, though, the screens will black out, and then whenever you go look to another one, that one will black out, and then the last one will turn on. Um, and the only thing you really get from the computer is uh, Daystrom Institute security protocols are currently in place. Mm. And Commodore, as you step inside, uh, Lieutenant Solvi looks to you and says... Ah, it's uh, good you're here, Commodore. He's been like this for a while, unfortunately. She'll walk in slowly, continue entering, and kind of uh, observe the screens and what's going on there, and just kind of quietly pace behind him. And um, then she'll start speaking to him and be like, Maddox, have you uh, checked in with your wife lately? He kind of pauses for a second, um, looks at one of the screens, keeps tapping on it, and then just says, "The you the sh the Sean's out of her. It, it's yeah. the Sean's out of her. She'll be okay. I need to keep going." And then he'll go back to doing what he was doing. What are you doing? Where are we going? It's not where, it's when. Humor me. Um, he'll turn to you. Uh, 
he kind of has a real he has a vacant look on his face until the computer dings and says uh zero point zero point found um at that he'll turn look at the screens tap on them a little bit more they'll run the they'll run a quicker version of the program and then it'll just zero point achieved um Matic will sit down he'll look at the screen and I found it uh what what are you looking for the first time before you ever time traveled I found the exact moment in time where the Sean become the Sean is in subspace where whenever the the whenever the galaxy first initial initialized and became its its known form the molecule spread out and then it i'm not great at science but the way i understand it is that it developed the subspace part of the explosion using technology using the portal information that that i still have from that i can gather from the arcadia from whenever i was on it years ago and using a modified flyer i i could go back in time to this exact moment and stop the sean from becoming the sean i could stop all of this right now i by not ever letting the sean become the sean you know as tempting as that might be for you it's it's I've... not tempting don't, don't you see? Like, now I'm having to realize I just planned a genocide. That's what, that's what this fucking, all this temporal f- fucking nonsense has driven me to. I, I originally did it just to go back in time and save Savia, but, but now it, at this point, it's, I'm contemplating committing genocide on a species that's barely affecting us that we'd be able to beat, honestly. The Undine, a temporary alliance with the Undine, and we would win. But that, I figured this out just by going off of what Anorax did and with how he used his time ship to adjust the timeline, adjust, 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 and just keep adjusting until things were right. But I'm looking at this information now and I'm trying to see where at what point did genocide become an option for me like how 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 am i able to look at this screen and say oh this is where i can go back in time and eliminate essentially trillions of lives i do it this time what stops me from the next time or what happens when what happens if somebody else gets this idea and uses my research to to go back in time and stop the Klingons from ever becoming a thing so then we never have the Klingon wars they stop the Romulans they stop uh (laughs) they go back in time and stop the Federation itself they go back in time and stop the Breen or this or what what point does this stop you know it Every, it's it's everyone just thinks it's real easy just oh let's hop back in time well people don't realize okay we go back in time we go back time 100 years and we decide that we're going to make Zeph we go back in time oh shit I'll go with 300 years and we stop and we make Zephyr and Cochran an hour late to meet the Vulcans well then somebody else meets them and Time is irreparably changed. Just like that. Just just by doing a fucking simple calculation and making some adjustments, it time just changes. And so then what? Does does that mean that because I can understand how to use this technology, that makes me some sort of fucking god? What what if me on the Arcadia, whenever I came across the Hyperion, 
What if that was done by some fucking Q and this is part of their fucking trial? How how do I know that none of that any of this is fucking actually me? How do I know this isn't the Q fucking with humanity still? Um, at that he'll grab his head and he'll uh, use his with his uh, hand and then slam his hand on the uh, monitor uh, computer. How much time has passed? How much time has passed since the Commodore entered this room? Approximately five minutes. That's that's not right. No, 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 no. It's she will put a hand on his shoulder and be like, it is right. He'll uh, he won't really he'll kind of like somewhat move to see if she'll remove it, but he won't like pull away. It's it, it can't be right. Like it's there's there there's no way that it's already been five minutes. Five minutes is may not seem like a lot, but to other people it is. And it's the this five it's there's no. There's no way. It may have passed fast for you, Maddock, but for me it's been an eternity. <laughs> have you listened to yourself? No. There, there hasn't been time. It's only I've only been able I've only had time to just think and think. Exactly. And think. You were so preoccupied with whether or not you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. Sylvie kind of motions for you to uh, come over and speak to her a little bit more privately. She'll go over to Sol- Sylvie. So uh, Sylvie lowers her voice, and if Maddox really tried, he could probably hear, but she is he's, attempting to be... He's, fo- he's focused on the screen that says, like, this is the zero point. Gotcha. So Sylvie says, Commodore, I think I've seen enough. He is experiencing the beginning stages of what we know as temporal psychosis. There's not much we can do... If he travels in time again, I'm worried we will lose him completely. How many other people have had this before? I've never heard of it. Really, our data on the, I wouldn't call it a disease, uh, condition, uh, dates back to Voyager's encounter with a certain member of the Temporal Integrity Commission. Uh, I cannot release the name due to... Ironically enough, the temporal integrity conditions rules, but that captain essentially was responsible for his own demise. And at the same time, we have a parallel scenario here with Mr. Maddock. Again, I don't know how to treat this. I I mean, I can do all the group therapy in the world. I can do regular therapy in the world, but... This is something that he's just traveled through time too much. And if he does it again, we might lose him. Completely, yes. I was going to talk to Lieutenant Commander Vassar and Lieutenant Commander Lee. It might be... We could try something with chronotons, I guess, but... If I had to put a percentage on a Commodore, there is a 99.5% chance that even a single trip two seconds into the future would lose Matic. Um, At the mention of Chronotons, uh, he does somewhat pick that up. He'll just shake his head and say it doesn't work. He'll tap on uh, one of the consoles and a report from the Daystrom Institute will pull up where... Um, they purposely induced temporal psychosis in people who volunteered and attempted to use chronotons to as a uh, medical procedure in order to try to see if it would help them. Okay. So Salvi looks at this and goes, okay, that's one idea down. Commodore, would you be adverse to me asking the crew if, well, the Vulcan part of the crew or the Romulan part of the crew, if they would be open to a mind meld. Failing that, my only other idea is to ask our uh, Undine friend to see if there's anything they can do. 
I don't have an issue with you reaching out to any Vulcan crew members, um, so long as they have experience. Noted. And then uh, Solvi speaks up and says, Hey, Matic, uh, you hungry? Need anything to eat? He just shakes his head and uh, just kind of glances between his uh, monitors. Okay. And as we pull away from that scene, we skip ahead a little. Oh, Watney, you had something maybe. No, it's okay. Okay. Uh, so we pull away from that scene, and ironically enough, what happens is we switch to another scene that stars Lieutenant Solvi. Uh, specifically, she is in her counselor's office with two officers, Commander Williams and Lieutenant Commander Lee. And you two have just se- yeah, seated yourselves, and Solvi kind of looks between you two and says... Uh, Thank you for coming, especially you, Mr. Lee. I appreciate you giving group therapy a further chance. Well, I I must admit that I found the experience somewhat enlightening, um, although much of that came by way of my conversation with the SAR. Well, the reason I've asked you here specifically, Lee, is I'm hoping you can do the same for Mr. Williams here. And she turns to Williams Mr. Williams, how are you holding up after your, for lack of a better term, accident with the Ferengi? Fine. Fine? (laughs) Yeah, fine. She just sort of looks at you knowingly and says, I find that very hard to believe. No, that's, that's just too bad. So you're just accustomed to that many lives. Were you in the war? I was not in the war, but my mother was in many. She told me many stories. Well. Conflict. People die. Sometimes the ones you wish wouldn't. Listen, RJ, I was in the war. I was a doctor. Uh, I understand that's true, but just because that's the reality we face doesn't mean that we have to actually grow accustomed to it. doesn't mean that it doesn't still affect us. And they'll both notice that RJ isn't really looking at either of them, just sort of staring down almost at his feet. Uh, this is, yeah, no, I, I get that. But my, my job is to protect you all, the ship, to do anything and everything to see this ship safely home. And if that means that I have to live with certain realities, then I'm going to find a way to do it. RJ, I think that's why we're here. Yes, we have to live with the consequences of what we've done, you and I alike, whether it's through phasers and photon torpedoes or modified deflector dishes or a failure on a surgical table. But it's finding out how to live and live well that is the real struggle. Yeah, and how's, uh, how's that working out for you, Tobin? Well, like I said, it's a real struggle. Look, I'm, I'm sorry. I know you're trying to help. I know you're both trying to help, and I appreciate that. But the fact of the matter is, Tobin, on that ship with the deflector dish, that was the best op I had. And people were hurt, yeah nobody died and there's a chance we can still save those people I don't have the luxury of that kind of thinking when I hit that ship again it was already disabled 
but I wanted to make sure they were out of the fight, and I made sure that I made sure everybody on that ship was out of the fight permanently. Biogenic weapons, explosions in a magazine aside. I could have checked the goddamn firing sensors. I would have seen that energy spike. RJ, all I, that's all, not just... All I could see was the threat. Vassar or I could take equal blame for that. We should have been able to scan the ship and determine its cargo, but they were running shielded. What else would weapon smugglers who are transporting biogenic weapons be doing? You couldn't have known. There was nothing that you could have done to find out that they were carrying those weapons. You were firing to disable. Well, you need to tell my mind that because every time I close my eyes, I see that ship detonate. And I see the scanner rigging. No survivors. Solvi the... speaks up a little bit <laughs> and says, So you close your eyes, you see all this. Are you able to sleep? Sleeping's not the problem. It's the, uh, it's the dreams. It, it'll pass. They have before. Tell me, Commander Williams, I haven't noticed this in your file. Are you a religious person? I believe that there are things in the universe well beyond our ability to comprehend. But if you're asking, do I believe in a god, gods, or others? No. Well, I'm not saying this needs to happen, but it occurs to me that someone like Mr. Lee here, he seeks solace in his faith. And I think what we need to do for you is find something similar. Again, doesn't need to be a religion, just something you can turn to for comfort and strength. I mean, traditionally, that's been my job. But lately, I don't know, with everything that's happened, I don't know. It's different. I get up every day, I put my uniform on, but I don't uh, I don't feel clean anymore. Tell me, how much do you know of the old Ophion? I mean, just just what they teach us in school. Do you remember a certain chief engineer, uh, Mr. Murthrin? Yeah, I remember the name. Do you remember when he inadvertently destroyed a entire starbase of Romulans? Yeah. yeah I, I read about that. I say this not because of a joke, but because it needs to be said, he lived with the stigma of the Murthrin Maneuver for the rest of his life. But he didn't let it get to him. Sure, he was like you at the beginning, where he didn't know what to do. He felt out of sorts. But eventually he learned to live with it. And I tell you this because I think it's important for you to know this isn't a career-ending event. This isn't a person-ending event. You can get past this. I 
hope you're right. I really do. I... I want to be able to get up in the morning and be able to smile at my reflection. Let's start with that. Next time you wake up, even if you don't feel like doing it, I'd like you to force yourself to smile. Just a couple seconds. Doesn't need to be long. I mean... Are you... Okay. Alright, I, I promise. And then, uh, I did want to give Lovecraft a chance to chip in, but if not, we will do a scene chains. Um, I think I would actually rather wait until she dismisses us, and then I'd like to speak with uh, RJ in the corridor for a moment. Sure, we can do that. So you guys just step outside the corridor. Uh, Solvi has a uh, 315 with Jensen, so you literally walk out, and Jensen's waiting outside the door, and he's like, oh, is, is it time? I love Lieutenant Solvi. She is great, isn't she? I'm glad that you're finding her helpful. Sure and uh, you notice that he's a little bit preoccupied with adjusting his uniform, smoothing his hair. Y you know what this is. But uh, he just sort of steals himself, walks in and says, Ah, Counselor, how are you doing? And then the door closes. Uh, listen, RJ. Um, the Counselor must be aware of this. She's read my file. But it does get better. I know that because for a long time, I wasn't able to look myself in the mirror. You know that uh, before I joined the Fenrir, I was demoted to lieutenant, right? Yeah, a senior service record. The ship that I was serving on uh, ran across an old gravitic mine lost power and containment fields in the medical bay went down. It exposed half the ship to a, a kind of Torellian plague variant. Well, long story short, the captain wanted to purge the vessel. She was going to run a baryon sweep through the rest of the ship. It was the only way that we could affect repairs to the ship to get repair crews down to the warp core before it's before it went up. I just needed more time. I just needed enough time to affect repairs. And so I forged medical records that suggested that she had broken under the stress. I was able to relieve her of command and take over the ship. And I was right. I was able to find a cure. We were able to enter the, the lower levels of the ship. But what I didn't realize was that the virus had mutated and that it affected anyone with a sufficient level of neuroplasticity. It lay dormant inside their neurological tissue. And... Uh, I don't suppose you know what that implies. Well, I can imagine from the look on your face that it certainly isn't good. Children, uh, Commander, have extensive levels of neuroplasticity. So all 15 children that were on the lower decks, including my son, died. And I didn't realize it. I didn't... I wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart enough. I didn't think through the consequences of it. It destroyed everything. I let it destroy my career. And it took years for me to get to the point where I could start to rebuild it. And RJ at this point, understanding Lee is meaning to comfort him now feels the need to do the same and will just sort of take him by the shoulder and say, well, Tobin.
I think one of the things that's hardest is that as a Starfleet officer, you're your own worst critic, and so am I. But what you did intentions are important the result is tragic i uh, i thanks for thanks for sharing uh, i think we maybe both have to allow ourselves a little bit of forgiveness. Oh, that's, uh, that's a difficult process too. Um, but I've had years to work through this and I'll be living with that for the rest of my life. I know that. What I'm trying to tell you though, is that as bleak as it is now, what you said applies to you too. You had the best of intentions and you operating on the knowledge that you had did the best that you could. Regardless of the results, it does get better. You'll learn to live with it. You know, I, I hear, I hear what you're saying, and a part of me believes that. And I'm, I guess I'm just going to have to find a way to grab that part. But. Uh, Tobin, I am so sorry. I uh, I don't have any words, but thank you. I, I mean that. You're welcome, and, RJ. And I want you to know that I think you are quite simply one of the finest officers I've ever served with. The feeling is mutual, Commander. And I'd like you to know that if you need help working through this, if you want to talk with somebody who's not a counselor but has lived through this and can give you his perspective, you know where to find me. I, I may just take you up on that. All right. So we shift scenes to something less heavy because we always need, you know, to balance out the heavy with the funny and or the interesting. <laughs> Mr. Vassar, you have been called to 6F to meet with Valerie Archer. And when you arrive in 6F, you see again that the uh, sort of lounge slash mess hall is full of people. But uh, the one who invited you here, Miss Archer is currently seated on one of the couches next to the window, and she's just passively observing the stars for the moment. You're muted, Dag. <laughs> Ms. Archer? She kind of does a little head twitch, turns and says, Ah, oh, Mr. Vassar, thank you for coming. Uh, please have a seat. He sits down awkwardly. And she does the same. She sort of uh, adjusts her seating and says, So, the reason I called you here, Mr. Vassar... Can I call you Mr. Vassar? I, I feel like I, I don't know if I should use your rank or not. Vassar is appropriate. Thank you. I've called you here because you and I are unique to this crew. If you... If by that you mean not traditionally carbon-based, then that would be true, counting Ambassador Charlotte. Hmm. That is one way, but I was referring more to how our minds work. I would assume that your mind is encapsulated in your brain. Mine is spread throughout the ship. That's partially true. 
But uh, I won't bore you with biology lessons, but let's just say that being who I am, it's a little taxing. It's almost like wearing a, a second skin. I believe I can relate to that. Well, uh, I did have... Where is it? Where is it? And she sort of pats herself down, looks around where she's seated. Ah, yes, here we go. Uh, she pulls out uh, one of uh, the models that you would normally see in sort of the background of a conference room. You know, like the little ship models. Uh, she pulls out what looks to be a... I'm trying to get the sizes right here. I think it's a 1 to 32 scale of not the Cerberus class, not the Fenrir, but the station or ship, because I don't think we've ever explored this, the station or ship where Vassar was first activated, like as a testing sort of a thing. And she says, I came across this the other day, and in an attempt to be more human, I thought I would offer it to you. Is she holding her hand up? Yeah, she's she's holding either the ship or the station model out to you. Vizar will reach out and nod in kind and accept the offering. Mm -hmm. Curious. You have found a 132nd replica of the station on which I was first activated in holographic form. How did you come across this? She uh, taps her brain a little knowingly and says, well, let's just say that uh, information gathering is one of my specialties. Since I cannot disprove that, I will accept your postulate. What can I do for you? Oh, you don't need to do anything for me. I simply wish to, oh, what is it that humans call it? Um, make a connection. Ah. What kind of connection did you have in mind? <laughs> she actually chuckles a little bit and says, well, I mean, if you really want to try the whole kissing thing, I'm not going to say no, but I think friends and acquaintance. I do not think physical gratification would be necessary at this time. However, an acquaintance would be satisfying. Oh, there was one other thing. And uh, she reaches out towards your holographic admitter, but kind of looks to you for guidance, like, can she touch it? If you take it off, I will cease to render in this area. No, I'm not going to take it off. I just want to try something. Okay. And almost like E.T., the tip of her finger glows, and she touches the emitter. I know you're a, Vul you're a Vulcan, like you are a holographic Vulcan, but if you allow me to say this, Vassar, you suddenly feel an immense amount of joy, just general happiness. It might be, because I don't think, again, I don't think we've explored this a bit. This is almost like what happened when Q gave Data the chance to laugh for the first time. And this is something that is happening to you, not on the same scale, but similar. Vassar's body language immediately relaxes. His eyes sort of just, his eyelids sort of droop a little bit. And he sits back into the chair. He just looks around contentedly. And then he looks out in, through the window of the six aft and is just so fascinated by the view. Most impressive. Thank you. You're very much welcome. If you do not mind, I would like to stay here and look at the stars with you. I'd like that. And as we pull away, we've been going for about an hour. So why don't we take our 10 minute break there? So stick around, everybody. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
BT Dub. Just... Hashtag not an ad. Yeah, hashtag not an ad. Anyway, the stream is only going to get the end of that conversation. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the uh, second part of a very heavy session. I'm probably going to have to do a content warning in the on the VOD. But anyway, uh, we cut ahead uh, probably about a few hours, and Commodore Archuleta has asked most of the senior staff to be present in the conference room for a important briefing. Uh, subbing in for Mr. Maddock is Lieutenant Zero. So, uh, Commodore, I believe you have uh, quite a bit to tell the crew about. Thank you for all joining me here. Um, our, our next move is one that I have to brief you on personally, as we'll be going to a different galaxy. Uh Yes, you heard that right. So many of you are familiar with the Ophion. The crew discovered Pandora's Gate. Um, this is a subspace portal. Um, it leads to the Andromeda Galaxy, and it's heavily guarded <clears throat> on both sides by subspace nodes, which I'm sure Commander Lee and Vassar know. These are areas of space where there is literally nothing, and they can extend for hundreds of light years. Um, so on one side is us, the Milky Way, the other side is the Andromeda Galaxy. The reason it's so heavily guarded is because there is basically a graveyard of planet killers there. Planet killers. You're referring to the weapons encountered by the crew of the Constellation and the Enterprise in 2266. That is correct. And you say it is a graveyard? Yes, they're defunct and broken. Okay, we're sure they're dead. So well, given they're... the fact there's an outpost on the other side of the portal that is put in place to basically collapse the portal in the event that anything tries to come through to the Milky Way, they're, and, they've been defunct, yes. And the Andromeda Galaxy, the two and a half million light years away Andromeda Galaxy, that one? Yes. I assume the portal is a wormhole of some kind. Wow. And we are going there for the purpose of? Repair. That seems like quite a long round trip. Well, it's technically the shortest. <laughs> shortest place to a station with a star dock where we can repair. I want y'all to know, though, that the uh, Andromeda Directive is what rules in this instance, which is which states that if a hostile for force manages to breach the gate, um, we have to destroy the gate no matter what side we are on. So keep that in mind. I suggest we collect a record of our logs and transmit them to Starfleet headquarters in the event that we are unable to return. At least then they will have the latest information on the Shan and can devise a defense. Good idea. Also, this is a need-to-know basis, so just for the Fenrir crew. And we will be taking all three of our ships through this gateway? We will have to in order to fully repair to come back in one piece. Captain, if I may, how distant are the defunct planet killers from the aperture itself? Would we pick it up on sensors? If so, we need to actually take precautions to ensure that none of the rest of the crew learn of their existence. Um, out of character, are the planet killers classified? Um, as far like, as I know, what they are, the planet killer, quote unquote, is not classified. It's kind of in that same sort of gray area where you would think Starfleet, like the Guardian of Forever, where Starfleet doesn't make it public, but they still have a guard on it. 
and Dag, feel free to correct me if I'm saying that completely wrong, but um, it's one of those things where the need to know is what keeps it safe, the security through obscurity method. Um, there mm -hmm. probably is knowledge that Starfleet has been to the Andromeda Galaxy, but not the how or the why. Okay. And... I mean, I'm assuming you don't need sensors to pick them up. You can probably just see them. Yes. Yeah. Um, Commander, we won't need sensors to see these. They'll be in plain sight. It's not a matter of if the Fenrir crew hears about it. Everyone on our ship is a need to know. That's your prerogative, Captain. Uh, Commodore. Yeah. And would that need to know extend to our Undine guests? Yes. Understood. Does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I've got one. When we get there, while we're in repairs, any chance of taking a shuttlecraft out for a look around this graveyard? We'll have to see how things are when we get there. But if so, I'll be going with you because I'm just as interested. Uh, I mean, I don't know anybody in Starfleet that didn't grow up on the the five-year mission just to be that close to something that it would be a it'd be like a dream come true i think despite you know if you can get over the fact that they can destroy entire planets and convert them for fuel yes there is that <laughs> um what's zero's rank Lieutenant. Lieutenant Zero, how are you uh, adjusting to your role in engineering? Mm, usually whenever Medic has gone off on his harebrained schemes, I have taken place. I've taken his place. Uh, it's also been exchanged with several other crew members. Um, I guess... My special circumstances are what made him feel comfortable leaving me specifically in charge, but uh, I, you'd have to ask him, even still. Ask him how you're adjusting? Well, ask him what his reasonings were for to leave me in charge. You Lieutenant, know, you said you said special circumstances. What what do you mean? Um he'll just kind of look at he'll look at Williams. Uh well being an android. A Tsung type, no less. There's more of us within Starfleet, however, with the exception of one previous commander data. I can't think of any of us really making it extremely high within rank, let alone department heads. Hmm. Well, that's something. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rast, anything to add? I believe we are. I believe things are, things are going well. Uh, thank you, Zero, and welcome to the table. Whenever we get to the starbase, I'll be sure to provide as many, as frequent updates as the engineering teams are able to provide me, uh, Commodore Commander. Thank you, Zero. Well, if you have no other questions, you are all dismissed. 
All right. So we're going to do a little bit of a travel montage here. And if you will imagine uh, the USS Fenrir uh, in its three parts uh, soars towards the, the location of Pandora's Gate. And right about when you would be about a light year out, uh, you receive a message. It is a simple message. It simply says that this area is under Starfleet control and that only, on our, only authorized personnel are allowed to continue. And it's simple enough for the Commodore to put in her codes, the buoys welcome you, and simply remind you of the Andromeda Directive. But as you press into the subspace node, subspace node, the stars around you begin to wink out until there is nothing but darkness. And the only way you know that you're on the correct path are a regular set of buoys that lead you directly to Pandora's Gate. Now, I know uh, I didn't really have uh, a way to show this, like the inky blackness against the gate. So this is what I found that was the closest. So if you will imagine a gigantic sort of ring-like structure that is beyond design of any Takan or any known ancient species. And the portal is lit up with an ephemeral white glow that sort of casts the surrounding area like you would expect a sun to. And as you fly closer... I have to ask one very important question. Who is at the helm? Of each ship? Of each ship, correct. Uh, Rast will be uh, at the helm in beta. Okay. Who has the highest... Are, is Williams on Alpha or Gamma? Because uh, Matic usually I... took Gamma, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I typically stay on alpha okay then we'll say a supporting character has gamma uh the reason i ask this is because as you begin to enter the portal there is a momentary loss of control and as you scramble to uh regain control it's over almost in an instant uh but it's flavor because when you arrive on the other side of the portal uh, what you see is that you've changed places. Again, you can't really tell because darkness to darkness, it looks the same. But visually, what you see on the other side as you emerge is a graveyard of planet killers. There's at least close to the portal in visual range, there's about six. But sensors would immediately report that there's upwards of 30 to 50 just chunks of these things these chunks of neutronium just floating through the air. Well, not the air, through space. But that's not the really impressive thing. The really impressive thing is the two-mile-long starship that is waiting for you on the other side. And I believe, Walter, you have a hail for the Fenrir crew. This is a USS Leviathan. Admiral Michael Beckett. What ships are coming through Pandora's Gate? This is uh, Captain Brie Archuleta. Uh, this is the USS Fenrir in multi-vector assault mode. Well, uh, isn't it Commodore, not Captain? Well, I just have the one ship with me right, right now, so... Well, I will... As someone who has brought an MVAM ship through that portal, having your ship in pieces isn't going to help you against the graveyard. But um, if you're in pieces, chances are, as our ship was, you can't put it back together, can you? You are correct. That's why we're here. Well, um, then call us Solace, because... I'll bring you in, and uh, we'll get you fixed up as quick as we can. Um, just bring it around to the second shipyard. Um, the Akagi F is in the first shipyard, so uh, uh, I'll meet you down there. Beck it out. 
And because I forgot to say it for people who can't see a screen right now, yes, that is a universe class, which you saw in Amalthea if you watched Amalthea. But we aren't going to go into the story right now. Maybe Beckett will in a bit, but either way. Uh, you were given coordinates for the Fenrir sections to fly into one of the USS Leviathan's I wouldn't call it a shuttle bay because it's just too big, but you are given clearance to land. And as the Fenrir crew pulls in and actually docks with the superstructure, I'm curious, what's going through everyone's mind right now? Not only have you just seen a planet killer, but you have seen a vessel that is unlike any other Starfleet has shown ever. Bree Sensors is... to full. So yeah, she's like soaking it all in. Um, Said goodbye to them to her galaxy, basically. So mm -hmm. just trying to get a get a hold on things. Yeah, I think William Williams would be in absolute awe of the planet killers, but probably more so in the uh, in the ship itself in the universe class. Lee would be attempting to run a metallurgical analysis on the uh, the planet killers to see what has caused them to be disabled. Is there weapon scoring? Because so far as we understood, they were actually impervious to any of our weapons. Tell you what, let's make it a roll, Lee. Give me a reason and a science. The ship can assist you with a computers in science. Difficulty of one. All right, that's two successes. Let's see if the uh, ship gets you anything with its computer science. Someone does have the ship, right? I'll roll it. Okay. Uh, computer science. Yep. be really funny if it was a complication okay it's not a complication so lee this is probably very scary to hear but most of the planet killers if you will imagine a planet killer being broken over a knee that's what you're seeing but as a reminder planet killers are made out of neutronium literally the strongest most dense material known to exist and there's these are snapped in half I don't think Lee would report this. Okay. There's there's really no reason to do so. Okay. And then I think the only one we haven't heard from is Mr. Vassar. What is Mr. Vassar thinking of all this? And I think we I don't they think we got Rast. So we'll we'll do Vassar then Rast. You're muted, Dag. Mm -hmm. Muted. Um Vassar is definitely taking into consideration all sensor data that's coming in uh, passive sensor data from the USS Leviathan the surrounding area and uh, any useful data from the planet killers gotcha and then Mr. Rast uh, Rast is uh, very taken by the uh, Leviathan um, and uh, he pays some attention to the planet killers but he's thinking about uh now that's a ship. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, as I set up the next scene, I'm curious, Captain, uh, would it just be you stepping out to meet the Admiral, or are you bringing along some friends? Hmm. I will bring Williams and Vassar. Okay. And, of course, if anyone else wants to sneak onto the ship, just throw, uh, just uh, let me know. But uh, let's see. Vassar... It would help if I was on the right layer. Vassar, Archuleta, and Williams. You step out of the Fenrir's airlock and waiting for you on the other side. Uh, would you have come alone, Beckett? Or would you have uh, something there with you? Um, I, I think the, uh, and I don't know if you have her token, but the aforementioned person that we were just talking about Okay. Uh, I would bring her with me as well. So uh, as the three of you step out, you see the Admiral. And uh, why don't you describe the Admiral for those who are not familiar with Mr. Beckett? 
Um, at this point, Beckett is probably getting up to, we're what, 2410? Mm-hmm. 2411. Um, he's in his 90s. Uh, he looks to be in good, good health. Uh, the token is back when he was a doctor, so he is much more gray uh, and not as much brown left in his hair. Um, he is wearing command reds and with him, uh, oh, the other point of fact, he is armed. The other person that is with him is a tall by human standards, uh, woman, um, who looks roughly the age. What was Sona? 21, 22 looking. Yeah. Very young. Um, standing next to him with a very lithe build, lith, lithe, um, and she, look, looking at her compared to some of the other humans around her, she does happen to look off. And I guess that's the best way of putting it. Um, but Beckett will, uh, will wait for everybody to, to come into the bay um and as elh just said calling it a shuttle bay is not doing it justice um all three sections of the fenrir um are inside of it all three sections have their own um let's say section of a space dock uh from any of the shows or movies that we've seen ships in space dock that's kind of what this looks like except for the fact that it's inside of another ship um and I think that's about it for the descriptions. All right. So Williams, Archuleta, Vassar, you see and hear all of this. You walk up to the Admiral and let you guys take it from there. Admiral, thank you for having us. This is my Chief Security Officer, Commander Williams, and my um, Chief Science Officer, Vassar. It's a pleasure to meet the three of you. Um, well, you already know who I am. I don't matter anyways. Uh, this is Captain Sona. She is, for the best way of putting it, my brain. Um, not exactly, but she basically runs by herself the operations of everything out here. Um, it kind of helps to have a supercomputer in your head. Um, but she runs the day-to-day -day operations of the Leviathan, um, and, uh, for that, though Starfleet doesn't know, she's the first command level, actual command level android. But, I, uh, I see you've run into a little bit of trouble with your ship, Captain, or Commodore. Yes, um, we engaged with... A Ferengi vessel near Brain Space. Unfortunately, some on board were compromised. The Federation is kind of dealing with a little issue we like to call the Sean. Um, mind parasites is the best way to put it. Oh. The vessel, the Ferengi vessel, was being controlled by one. Interesting. Well, thankfully, we're. I've read up on it a little bit, but we thankfully haven't had to worry about it out here, anyways. We have all the other problems of, you know, being uh, a few decades from home, 100 years from home. I, I stopped trying to keep track of how far away from home we are. Sona just turns to you, uh, Admiral, and says, Admiral, I would remind you that the Leviathan's engines would get us home in approximately five years, 20 days, and she goes all the way down to the nanosecond if you let her. I knew she was going to do that. Ever the cheerful to remind me how long it would take to get home. But um, is your crew in good standing, good health, good spirits? I was expecting to see a uh, 
a bearded engineer come off the ship, but uh, I guess he's probably overseeing everything himself. Never liked anybody else to touch his ship. Well, you're not wrong about that. Um, unfortunately, Maddock is have is, has had some trouble as of late, uh, given all the time travel that he's done. So Beckett will roll his eyes. My sentiments exactly. <laughs> and you just can't get him to stop. Uh, well, well, we may be rapidly approaching the time when he does, Admiral. Hmm. Well, time always catches up to everybody. Anyways, um, if, well, obviously it's your ship, but you can feel free to relieve your crew and let them take a little bit of shore leave. It's not exactly home or dirt side, but the Leviathan is very spacious and a good place to at least let off a little bit of steam and relax. I have some very interested uh, officers who find the surrounding landscape interesting. What's your protocol for hazarding not a full trip, but a shuttle ride out to have a look at the planet killers? Is that safe? Uh, yeah, it's safe. Um, as I'm sure if you have a science officer that's worth their salt, they already know the status of the graveyard and the things that are in it. Um, I think that's something that can be arranged. Um, Thank we you. can take, we can take one of the Corvettes out and, uh, we'll, we'll make a run of it. She's going to look over her shoulder at Williams and be like, there, I asked. Just like... <laughs> I know anybody who, uh, uh, let's say, is a fan of Kirk and his missions. Anytime, well, let's just say the, the, you're not the first one to ask. We uh, end up happening to do regular trips, like somebody visiting a landmark. For anybody who's read any of the books or the stories or anything of the great Captain Kirk that wants to go see them. How many visitors do you get out here? Nah, not that many. Um, occasionally some old friends who were a part of one of the first two missions um, after the Ophion first came here. Uh, sometimes they'll swing by and just to marvel their new crews at the things that we had done in the past. I see. Uh, and do you mind cluing me in on what could do that to one of those? Well, I would say you're standing on her, but even I don't know if the big sister can actually handle one of those things. But it, I could, but it would be something that's best talked about not standing in the middle of a, you know, city-sized space dock. Ah, you're right. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's all right. Um, the view, the trip in, that feeling you get when you cross through the through the gate for the first time, it all kind of gets to you a little bit. Um, I will say, though, uh, just because of the things that I'm sure you're clued in on, uh, if you'd like to have your ship um, broadcast out any kind of um, record or whatever, um, to one of the buoys that's on the other side. Um, that's usually standard protocol just in case we kind of have to do what we have to do. All right. Uh, I will um, make sure that happens. Thank you. Not a problem. And like I said, you, your sensor operator should be able to find the buoys. Um, you probably followed them on the way in through the blackness, through the graveyard. But um, yeah. So which first, your uh, tour of the landmark or the conversation? I'd like to have the conversation first before I go out there. Understandable. Um, I'll, I'll take you to the office and uh, 
Sona, if you can get them all squared away and get one of the Corvettes for us. Uh, yes, sir. I was simply curious. Uh, should we be taking the good one or the bad one? Oh, that's right, because the very good one's out on patrol. Um, we'll take the good one. Yes, sir. Though I would comment that we still haven't gotten the smell of the Zenkefi out of it. Nah. It'll be fine. Very good. And uh, Captain Sona turns to Williams and Vassar and says, uh, If you gentlemen would follow me, I will give you a brief tour of our facilities. Sar will not leave to the captain. Um, and yeah, Becker... Um, captain, I appreciate the tour, and when you have a moment, I, I have a couple of questions for you. And uh, uncharacteristic of most androids, Sona actually smiles. And uh, she says very welcomingly, You are not the first to have many questions. I would be happy to answer. Um, and Beckett will turn around and look at Sona and say, and Sona, let me know if um, the Matic protocol is broken. <laughs> she actually does chuckle a little bit and says, yes, sir, we do have guards ready to handle a Matic breach. We have also locked him out of all Leviathan computers. We have Chronoton fields ready to go. We are ready for him, sir. Good. I uh, I look forward to the two of you mentally sparring again. And then uh, Sona just turns back to Williams and Vassar and says, well, we will start our tour with a few factoids. We have a circumference of our saucer section, approximately 10 kilometers, which means we have about a uh, area of 8.136688 kilometers squared. And, you know, you, you your little group sort of walks off uh, towards one of the actually rare uh, Jeffrey's or not Jeffrey's tubes, uh, one of the rare uh, turbo lifts that are on the vessel. As for the captain and the admiral, uh, what happens is Admiral Beckett just sort of taps his chest, says, "Beam me to my office or something similar." And Archuleta, you rematerialize in a very nice, almost ornate looking. Uh, sort of office. It doesn't really have the standard Starfleet trappings. Uh, this is more a, if I had to qualify it, this is more of a, a rustic feel that you would maybe find in maybe a private investigator's office. Um, there's an actual wooden desk with various doodads and widgets on it. Uh, there is even a coat rack. Uh, there's also a vast library that sits across sort of a reading space. But what really catches your attention, Archuleta, is the view. Uh, the office looks out onto the saucer section of the of the Leviathan. And again, the Leviathan is very large. There's literally eight kilometers squared of space. So there are not per se just a bunch of decks. It is an almost open atrium filled with roads, multiple cities. This is this is huge. Like you are literally inside a floating starbase that is perhaps rivaling even Earth Star Dock. It is a sight to see. And even as you maybe sort of take in your surroundings, a uh, a few shuttles literally fly through the air. And I would say without e even needing a roll, mostly what you're seeing are shuttles flying around. But there's also these little vehicles like golf carts that people seem to be driving around. And getting from place to place. You had to get the golf cart in. Oh, I have you? to. You know, it's it's the standard <laughs> traffic. You you got to have a golf cart. Um, so Bree will go over towards the window and, you know, get a full picture of what's around her. And um, then she'll look back at the Admiral and say, you probably don't get too lonely out here, right? <laughs> No, not usually. Um, it, it's hard to be lonely with 47,685, because there was two babies born yesterday, uh, people within about a 10-mile-ish square. Not 
not that large, it's like but a, close enough. It's like an entire city. Maybe even more. It can be. It, it, it definitely can feel that way. Um, it was... It was a shock when I first saw this ship, and it was even more of a shock to be told, well, no certain terms, here are the keys, by the way, go f finish your mission that you started 10 years ago. And what is that mission? Uh... Elh, you told me the original one was classified, yes? Yes. Okay. So after, let me tell you very, well, I'll, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. The Ophion found this portal almost by mistake. Um, we took the entire ship, the entire Prometheus class, threw it, saw the graveyard on the other side, and in the best way possible I can say it turned the hell around and went back the other way after a fairly long and heated uh, debate um, the captain uh, Barton Skull uh, decided against actually my recommendation to keep the gate open and to continue to explore it the thought and the premise of Starfleet of being exploration overrode um, my concerns of the fact that if anybody got a hold of what's in that graveyard, it could, in no uncertain terms, change the balance of everything. And I don't mean the balance of power between nations. I mean the balance of the entire Milky Way. So I did what any officer should do. And I wrote a strongly worded letter uh, of my reservations of us leaving this thing open. Now, just a few months after that happened, a, a billet of opening, of becoming a captain of my own ship was proposed to me. Now, I don't know if you know many people that go from being the uh, CMO of a ship and then being handed the keys to another one, but that's what happened. And it was mainly off the back of that report and that letter that I wrote. And myself and the Lysithia was sent through the portal or through the gate, as I started calling it, to go to the other side and go to the Andromeda and, and do what we as Starfleet do and explore. I took a crew made up of people from just shy of a hundred different species. And we went through, we took the best and the brightest. I don't know how I got put in charge of that, but well, I guess I do, but, and we came through. We explored for just shy of three years, which was our original mission was set for two years. We went across with the knowing that if anybody got a hold of those planet killers, or if we found a race on the other side that we just happened to piss off in the wrong way, that my job was to destroy the portal with me on the other side and a crew of a couple hundred. Now, I don't know many people that would actively, <laughs> that would take that kind of job to be told, here's people that are under your command. Oh, by the way, if things go south, you're gonna strand them years from home. And well, thankfully that didn't happen. We made nice with a lot of people, made some friends, and gathered a whole lot of information to send another another ship through when we were done. After us was the first official trip into Andromeda, um, which was a ship called the Adiona. Now, the Adiona was a very small ship, 
but what it lacked in sensors and in some dirty little tricks that the Lysithia had, it made up for the fact that it had a QSD. And if push came to shove, they could get home in a lot shorter amount of time than we could. Well, bad things happened to the Adiona. Um, things that shouldn't happen to anybody. Being messed with with messed with by uh, an omnipotent power, having your history rewritten, and basically being forgotten by Starfleet for a little bit of time. Some things happened with the gate as well, and a small battle that happened near it caused it to shrink to where very only very small ships could get through. So they couldn't send anybody to help. And when I made pleas, begging, offering up my job, and contemplating going rogue to go save them, me and my crew and the little sis, little sister, the Lysithia, get put to go settle a chunk of the Gamma Quadrant. And when I pleaded and argued to try to go help the people that I took responsibility for, because they were taking the sh second shift of my mission, uh, I was told that if I didn't go, that not only I would be stripped of rank, but so would everybody under my command. So I went. And for a few years, we got stranded in the Gamma Quadrant. In a ship that I thought was the biggest damn thing I'd ever seen. That Jupiter class was so, so huge. And well, one thing led to another and some Let's just sprinkle in a little bit of classified right here. Uh, we ended up finding this ship. That's not from our time period. Hmm. I know, long-winded story, a lot to take in, but <laughs> hey, you asked. I did, and thank you for telling it. Uh, so that explains the design then. It's just quite different than what I'm used to on board the Fenrir. So you mentioned something when we met at the dock about my question of regarding what could destroy the, those planet killers out there the way that they are given the nature of them and you said it was this ship uh that was a lie um yeah, let's just call it admiral's prerogative um the best that we on the ophion we never found out we we just had um rumors and speculation and and the best guess that people could come up with because after all, as we all know, it took a Constellation class ship being rammed down the middle of it to get the only other one anybody's ever seen to blow up. So talking to some of the people on this side, apparently these things were used in a uh, I guess the best way to put it is a defensive action. A race bent on genocide, subjugation of every other race. Um, these things were turned against it and stopped them. If I'm remembering correctly, there's a knock at your door, Admiral. Uh, come in. 
in steps a figure that uh, Archuleta, for a moment, you think, oh, hey, it's Solvi. It's not Solvi. It is an older looking uh, Solvi, uh, much more mature, maybe even lines on the face. Uh, but same sort of long pointed ears, uh, still humanoid, almost alabaster white skin, and uh, is wearing a Starfleet uniform. Uh, she currently holds the rank of uh, captain. And uh, the captain walks in and says, Has my husband been giving you the long and short of it? Mostly the long? <laughs> uh, yes, he has. Mm. But I've enjoyed it. Good, because usually when he does this, I get reports that, uh, let's just say uh, Sona and I have to deal with the after effects. And mm -hmm. she sort of glares daggers at you, Beckett, like, why? <laughs> I, I, I get long-winded, I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm here to report, Commodore, that your ship will be serviceable and able to reconnect within the next two days. Well, that's a lot quicker than I expected. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm assuming your technology here is more sophisticated than what I know of back in the Milky Way. Well, it's not just that that I've uh, come to uh, say hello and stop my husband from rambling. Tell me, how is our daughter doing? I was going to get to that question, but, well... Has she made you have any group sessions? <laughs> yes, actually, um, including myself. Oh, she started. Oh, oh, she started big. Yeah, but she knows what she's doing. And I think she's doing well. Well, I wanted her to go to more. The more physical side of medicine. Her mother wanted her to be, well, just more physical. And I guess she just, she rebelled against both of us. And uh, Sparja just looks at you, Admiral, and says, are we really going to do phrasing? Are, are we still doing phrasing? We've been over this. I, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Commodore. No, I, just... uh... I know I don't want to get in the middle of it. You know, I she's a valuable asset to to my crew. So couldn't imagine the Fenrir without her. That's good to hear. And I was glad that she got the posting that she did. Um, I she wanted to get as far away from here as possible. So I pulled some strings and made it to where she wasn't as far away as possible, but you get my drift. So this is home for her. Well, yes. Here or originally the Lysithia, but yes, here. Oh, you mean that home? No, no, no. Uh, well, this is home because this is where her family is, but home for Dear, you're rambling again. I know. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So about that tour of the graveyard. Yes, I'm quite looking forward to it. All right. So uh, this is sort of the point in the episode where I think we could go one of two ways. Um, the first, and this is an open question to everybody at the table, um, the first is that obviously you guys want a tour of the Planet Killers. You want maybe a tour of the uh, Leviathan, you know, get your data. Um, but it's one of those things where we can either uh, play it out narratively, which would maybe take about an mm, hour, two hours. It would take a while. Uh, or what we can do is what we do is we end the session here, but then we start the next one with you all have gotten all your tours done and you all can sort of gush at each other like, oh, I got to see this, or oh, I got to see this. Um, and I think that could lead to some cool scenes, but it's really what you guys as players would prefer. I vote the latter. As do I. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, that is where we will end the session as we pull the camera out of uh, Admiral Beckett's office 
outside of the Leviathan. And then our last sort of shot is of the Leviathan, the portal, and the planet killers all just sort of floating in space. And that is where we bring this session to a close. So uh, Twitch, YouTube, thank you so much for tuning in. We had a great turnout tonight. Thank you for uh, turning out. It's uh, hopefully a lot of fun to watch. But this is where I'm going to end the stream. So Twitch, YouTube, thank you so much. And you'll see these guys next Tuesday. Later, stream.